occasionally you'll get a, a, a saxophone where the cork is just kind of coming loose a little bit on the ends. And I, I told you, and I'll, I'll kind of retract it a bit, uh, to not try to re-glue things. Uh, sometimes if, if it really just didn't have enough glue to begin with, that's not always a bad choice. Cork, especially this amount of cork, is expensive. And uh, so you could get uh, your acetone, uh, clean a little bit of that area where it needs to go down, kind of work a little bit on that, but definitely make sure that right where that comes down is really clean. Uh, I often will put a little dab of glue on uh, on the bench top. Uh, well, not the bench top on on the surface that I'm working on. If you've got uh, masking tape or packing tape, put a little piece of that on your bench, and then you can drop glue and things on that when you're done. Peel it off your bench; it's nice and clean. So I've put a, a drop of that there. I now have some of the glue on a on a pipe. I mean, on a toothpick. I'll spread that, and I'm not going to spread this real thin yet. I'm going to go ahead, press down the, the spot that was loose, and then I pull it back up. Uh, and So you, you press it down, and you pull it back up. That spreads the glue evenly on both surfaces, and then we leave this to dry a bit. And this is one of those places you're going to want to err on the side of really letting it dry because this is kind of a one-shot option for you to do that. If you can get it in there, you can save that cork. It might get you another six months or a year out of it before you need to replace it, but, but that works well. Uh, and we will come back and cork this in a second. Previously, if you recall, we had a cork that was loose a bit. And uh, even though we don't necessarily want to re-glue things, the cork uh, is a little bit expensive. A saxophone neck takes quite a bit more cork than a clarinet joint. So if everything else is okay, we want to save this one. So we pried up the loose edge. We've cleaned it out. Uh, we took a toothpick and, uh, and we worked in a bit of our glue, pressed it down, pulled it up. We've now allowed it to dry. At this point, we tack it down and then put a rolling pressure on that uh, and at that point that should be good for another number of months before you're going to need to replace that cork. Uh, also you always have the option on that even if it's loose to wrap it in the Teflon tape in an emergency that'll keep everything down. Uh, we're going to go ahead now and show how to replace the entire cork. Uh, Saxophone corks are typically held on with two different materials, either the contact cement that we've been talking about or they're held on with shellac. Uh, stick shellac is made from, uh, it's actually kind of a secretion of a certain kind of beetle called the lac beetle. Uh, they get this material, they scrape it off of twigs, they, uh, it gets into a solution of alcohol where they dissolve it and then they let it dry form it into sheets, into sticks. Uh, you've eaten it before. That's what gives the shine to apples and oranges. It's used in a lot of different industries, but it's used very much in the musical instrument industry as an adhesive for corks, pads, felts, things like that. The only disadvantage is it's rather brittle and it doesn't withstand a lot of shock and uh, it's just a little more difficult to deal with for regular people on corks. So we're not going to use that but I'll tell you how to clean that up in a sec. So first thing we start with is we just are going to cut off the, the cork. Uh, you could try to use um, a scraper like we did on the clarinet. Typically it doesn't come off quite that easily. So we will get and razor blade this off. Stay right up close to the edge of the cork. You don't want to scratch the lacquer. We just want to start right with that edge. If you're concerned at all about that, put a little layer of tape right up to it and that'll protect it. Uh, go right off the edge. Some saxophones, like this one here, have a support ring and when you get up to that thing you can't just go all the way off the top. You may have to do a little bit of stuff up to the edge or then take a scraper to get around, uh, around the edge on that. Uh, when we've got this pretty close to being off, we can either uh, sand it 
Again, you could get like the bench peg thing, some sandpaper. That way, uh, often, if you remember, I was telling you about that the contact cement is really old and hard and difficult to get off. That's exceptionally true on a saxophone neck. So this is one of those places where using fresh contact cement to remove old contact cement works real well. But I need to warn you, the amount of space that we're doing here does create a, a bigger area for the fumes to evaporate, and it can be just a little less uh, safe. I mean, it's not really, I wouldn't say it's safe, but it's not really hazardous to do it regular. This one does have just enough fumes that you'll, you can notice it. So make sure you've got a good breeze coming on. Uh, but anyway, work on a nice little layer of stuff. When I'm putting the, the contact cement on later when I install it, I do it the same way. I just put a little layer on here and I just uh, work it on until I've got one nice thin uh, coat. So now we leave it just a little bit and now with our, our thumb in here, uh, we can see here where uh, how this area is nice and clean, at least it's, I mean, it's bare metal, and this area here now has the old stuff on. And it, you're able to get all of that stuff off without having to do a lot of scraping, without having to do a lot of sanding. You're uh, maintaining the integrity of the neck. And when you're dealing with some vintage saxophones, when you think of the life of an instrument and how often it might have to have its neck recorked, Every time that you do it, you want to be aware of the generations to come and do things that are not, uh, not going to give you any problems. So, uh, In addition to that, uh, acetone will also remove some of the last bit of your cork, uh, I mean your glues. Put it on a cloth. If you kind of hold it against it a little bit longer, it'll allow those solvents to, to get it off and then it'll evaporate right away. If it was held on with shellac, denatured alcohol uh, will, will dissolve that. Okay, so bottom line is we get our, our neck nice and clean and prepared for the cork. Similar to the clarinet, finding the right thickness, uh, if it was really, really loose, then you're going to want to select a cork uh, that is you know, significantly thicker than what else you were using. But the thicker you go, the more sanding this is going to require, and it can be a little bit time-consuming and difficult. All right, now we're going to select the cork. Uh, preferably before you took your other cork off, uh, if I were redoing this one and my mouthpiece, if, if it goes really easy and on too far, especially if it's wobbly on the end, that's a good sign that if this is the mouthpiece that I'm using, and it's not, but if this were the mouthpiece I use on this instrument, it would be a good idea for me to replace the cork on this one. So you can kind of go to the area here that hasn't uh, compressed yet, that is still intact, and get an idea if you have some cork that is going to work for that thing. It can be maybe a little bit thicker, um, whatever you have on hand. Uh, you're going to have to err on the side of thicker versus thinner if you have a very limited selection of cork. You may be lucky, depending on the thickness of cork that you're using, that if you needed to, you could go to a hardware store and they have an assortment of gasket material that, that's used for automotive repairs. And some of them have some cork material that you could use. Uh, you might. If, if you're lucky and it's there, use it go ahead. Uh, your chances are not going to be really great of finding exactly what you need on that one though. Uh, cork is expensive. Uh, a good sheet of cork like this can run you over $20. Uh, and you know, so depending on what you're doing, just one, doing one neck can be, you know, four or five dollars worth of cork. And if you have to redo it a few times, then your money runs up. You don't want to just waste the material. So given that, uh, even though I could measure this and go all the way around, you see by the time we get here, I've got way too much length. And if I've cut that whole thing up, if I had some cork elsewhere that I need this long, I've just cut it in half and reduced what I could use that particular piece of cork for. So on this one, uh, I've got plenty to wrap it around on the smaller side, so I'm going to use that as the, the segment that we're going to work from. Um, 
So this, at first, I just tend to eyeball about where my length was. Uh, if, if there's not a ring, I'm going to go ahead and make sure that this cork just goes past the end of the neck, and then I'll trim it to fit later on. But in the meantime, we'll go just a little bit past it and mark it, measure how far out that was. That's like, you know, one and, one and three quarters inches. And this stuff is not really, really, wait a minute. Yeah, let's just, uh, I don't know how to use a ruler. So, uh, so we'll get on there and make our mark. Um, one thing that's nice to do on this one, and a cork does tend to bend easier one way or the other. It, it's, it comes from the bark of a certain type of oak tree, which grows in the Mediterranean. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful material, been used for centuries uh, for all kinds of things, including wine corks, of course. Uh, but it does tend to bend easier one way or the other because of the fact that it was surrounding the tree. It grows naturally in one way or the other. In the other direction, it really doesn't want to bend that way. So if you have cork that is somewhat uh, unpliable, you may need to soften it up. You may need to soften it and make sure that you bend it in the right direction. Okay, so we're pretty happy that this will bend that way. So given that, it's nice to put a little bit of a bevel on the edge of the cork that's visible on this side. Uh, and it's sometimes hard to do that in place. So we're going to start by at least beveling this edge. Uh, so the surface that's going to be on the outside, we put down. We put a straight edge down here. And we're going to let our razor blade ride on this edge at an angle. So it just automatically leaves us a really nice beveled edge. Uh, it, again, people are, they notice these little things. Okay, so we'll go back and check our measurements. I'm pretty happy with that. We'll line up our marks and trim this. Okay, again, we're going to wrap this around. And by the way, this, uh, even though this cork went a little bit further, it looked kind of long, you know, longer than I like. And I've got, I've got some pretty decent lacquer and stuff intact here. So we're going to move this a little bit further, make it not quite so long. Uh, and given that, I've got a little wider piece of cork here than I'd want. We really don't want to waste that. But you're going to be able to save all of your pieces. You can use them for other things later on. Uh, so we're going to be go wrapping around. So we want one edge to be beveled like we did on our clarinets. And just like we beveled this edge, a really easy way to get that long bevel is you put the, uh, the good side down, a straight edge, your razor blade on it, and you're tilting the razor blade so that it runs underneath the straight edge that you're using, using the straight edge as a guide. It, it just gives us a really beautiful beveled tapered edge. Now, the, the options that I see other people try to do is they'll try to do various things this way. They'll get uh, an emery board they'll get sandpaper, whatever it is that they try to do, it never ends up working as well as this technique that I found here. And it, um, it's fast. It, it's fast, it's great, it's even. Uh, so, next thing that we're going to do is we're going to apply the cork, I mean the contact cement to the cork. Again, a very thin line right along the edge of this thing here. Just a little bit there, we'll use our pinky to spread that on there. Try not to get it too far onto the good surface. I uh, don't think I mentioned yet, but I always spread glue with my pinky. And the reason on that is I can put glue and stuff on all day long, and if my, my pinky's dirty, I still have clean fingers that I can use. I just keep this one in the air, and then throughout the day, then you find myself biting the dried glue off my finger. Okay, so we got that on this edge. Now we'll apply the contact cement on the other edge. You want to work quick because you want a really good coating of, of glue all the way to the edges 
And when you're putting glue on top of glue or on top of kind of half cured glue, it, it just makes it so that it doesn't function as well and it doesn't last and invariably it wants to come off later on. So once it's down, it's down. If you got it a little thick, let it dry, it'll be okay. But trying to go in after the fact and add more glue or remove glue is usually a, a recipe for, for a bad outcome. Uh, next thing on here too, we'll put uh, a little bit of glue. I only go about a third of it this way and then I'll take three fingers. Of course, my little pinky technique isn't going to work on this one. I'm going to have to clean my fingers off pretty good. So I'll go right up to where it is, then turn it, work my way out here, make sure that I've got glue all the way around. I'll put just a little bit more on the very end here, because this is a place where it typically, if it's going to be loose, it's on the very end. And so that gives us that little bit of insurance. So we've got the glue on there. We'll let this dry. Uh, not to the point of being tacky, but to the point of actually being dry to the touch. You don't want it to like grab or have any stickiness at all, but just to the point where it's dry, and then we'll put it back together. Oh, what do I have a water? Oh, okay. oh hey. Uh, yeah, it's finally dry. Uh, that's cool. Okay. Uh, sorry, Charlie Parker. Uh, once the glue is dry. Then we can put it together. Contact cement again works by the chemical reaction when the two dry surfaces touch. Uh, one thing you're going to have to just learn how to deal with in time is uh, managing the taper of a sax neck. Uh, sometimes, especially like on the tenors or, or berries, they have a little more pronounced taper and when you place the cork on and you wrap around. By the time you get to the other side, sometimes you're, you know, you're really offset on the ends. So you may have to trim it a bit. In time you'll get so that you have a pretty good uh, feel for how to place that. So I'm going to start my placement here, having this edge pretty much uh, level with the center line of the instrument and then work my way slowly around. As I get close to the other side I can kind of have an idea of where I'm headed and try to tease it a little bit one way or the other. The, the flexibility of the cork and the contact cement will give you just a little bit of wiggle room, not a whole lot. Just, just a little bit. So once we get over to that side, right on the seam you want to press that down a little bit. This area here is where you can run into a little bit of problem, trimming off the initial excess. There's nothing nicer than a fresh, clean edge with a razor blade. There's times I'll be doing something and using a particularly difficult material where I will get one edge with one razor blade and that's it. I'm not going to try to reuse it. I'm not going to try to do something. I want a clean edge and I'll sacrifice one blade each time. They just don't cost that much. Uh, and on that note, which one was the fresh one? <laughs> okay. Now, when I go to trim this one, if I get my razor blade at too close of an angle, I can end up kind of scalloping out this whole edge that I've just worked so hard to get a good bevel on. So initially, we're going to kind of keep our razor blade tilted up here and just get enough of that excess off to where we can see what we're working with and then work our way a little bit closer. A lot of this stuff that you, you can sand off but it's always difficult because you can end up with flat spots. So the closer that you can get to a final, a final fit with that overlap with your razor blade, the better the trap. So this is kind of what we're looking for at this point. Okay. Also at this point, again, we're, now we're going to really press in that cork and that cement so that it's got a really, really good, uh, really good bond. Uh, on the end of this, you'll just see with my overlap, we judged this pretty darn close. We've got just a little bit of an overlap here, and that little spot 
we can just kind of follow this right here, keeping the angle that we've put on the cork and just get that last little bit. The, the glue we'll get off with a little bit of acetone or fingernail polish remover. Okay, now this is a, a saxophone that, uh, where the cork goes all the way off the end of the neck. This is one of those things people will go back and forth on. Are you supposed to take the cork all the way off the end of the neck or do you come up to the support ring or do you come up to the support ring and cork on top of the support ring? Uh, in my experience, if the saxophone was made without the ring, you cork all the way to the end of the neck and trim it flush. If it was made with a support ring, you cork up to the support ring and leave that little, that little shelf that you will have in there. It seems like the acoustics of the instruments are typically designed around those two parameters. Uh, that's just the way I, I do it. Uh, your mileage may vary. So uh, now we're going to, I'll be looking down inside and trimming the excess of this off just a little bit long. And uh, this is also another one of those spots where you may want to use a fresh razor blade. And the reason for that is the technique that I'm going to be using to go around the circle is I will start with the tip of my razor blade here and I'm going to be using a slicing cut. It's kind of like I'm trying to use a fresh spot of this razor blade at each point around the perimeter or pretty close to that so that it's just got fresh, a fresh edge everywhere that I'm at. So I'll, I'll kind of start my cut here and I'm resting on the edge here. You see me going in towards the end of the cut. I can come back here and if you find that you that that one slicing thing doesn't work, little back and forth slicing cuts works real well. Do you see how we've got that really nice shaving that's coming off there? That typically will leave you a really nice uh, nice edge. Uh, now on saxophones, I don't always get a one shot, one kill sort of uh, thing here. I mean, I like that. I like it to be just one nice slice and it's the perfect finish when I'm done. But that doesn't always happen. And so um, that's where you may want to just take and do a really light, really light bevel. Um, and you kind of hear that I'm hitting the metal a little bit that's okay and we actually want on on the very end to just do a very light uh, polish on this and some of this I probably should do after we've made sure that we've got all of the sanding <laughs> of the cork but I'm pretty confident that this is is pretty darn close uh, this fits good other than just the bit of tightness right where I've got the overlap so again we get our sandpaper this is one of those places where uh, coating the back of the sandpaper with the packing tape is really effective. It, it gives you the ability to really uh, put a little bit of heft behind what you're doing and not worrying about the, the sandpaper uh, tearing on you. Uh, now, again, you can just hold it and do little strokes this way, or if you have a bench peg type thing, you can uh, hold your sax neck in that way. The only thing is because of the bend of this, you have to kind of maneuver your body a bit to get a good, um, to get a good connection. Uh, this is another reason why I always start my joint uh, kind of on the bottom thing here. It allows me to at least get that joint sanded um, with both hands free on my sandpaper. Uh, again, remember that when we've put our cork on one way and it overlaps this way, we want to sand in the direction of the overlap. We don't want our sandpaper to grab this and pull this off. So that's, that's really important for the longevity of the job that you've done. Uh, and at this point, we just want to do a nice light sanding just to give us an even appearance. Uh, 
uh, kind of to break the break the surface a little bit so that when we do the wax that it can really go in. It depends on how old your cork is. One thing to be aware of also, uh, when you're dealing with a sax neck that has a pretty pronounced taper on it, if you're using thin cork, when the player goes to put the, uh, the mouthpiece on, you're going to have one of two things. You're going to have uh, a mouthpiece that's really loose at the beginning, and as you get further in, right now I'm, I'm past the point where this is kind of compressed, but this is what would happen. The further up that taper you get, the player can't even get this mouthpiece on, and then you also have a bit of acoustical turbulence where that gap exists inside. Um, that's you know a little for another clinic, but the, the thing is, if you see kind of the difference between these two, this is a cylindrical cork compared to a tapered appearance. Uh, so on this cork, if it were, if it's tight in the beginning, it's going to be the same amount of tight all the way in. It's going to be consistent from beginning to end, and that's what you want. So if kind of reverting, if you have a really big taper, you're going to have to start out with cork that is a thicker here and then sand it to where it's going to be extremely thin on this end because you want it to be the same diameter end to end. So this is still just a little bit tight for my taste on this, so I'm going to sand this just a bit more. Uh, this is one of those places that it, it, you're going to have to be kind of careful. It's easy to slip and scratch the finish, and especially on a newer saxophone, you don't want a bunch of scratch marks from your sandpaper. So go ahead and take you know, another strip of your packing tape and protect the neck. Okay. Now, I want you to look at the overlap here and just how nice and clean and even that is. And that's going to seal really nice. Uh, sometimes you'll see one again where they've tried to just, you know, butt the ends together, kind of like this, rather than it being overlapped like this. And that's if it, if it's done perfectly, it works, but it still doesn't work as well as the overlap. Okay, so now we'll go back to the paraffin wax again. Again, you could use the lighter. Uh, you can use. You know, if you need to, you can just have a burning candle. The only problem with that is paraffin smokes quite a bit when it's burning. And then all this nice, clean uh, work that you've tried to do is now going to be kind of sooty looking. So we don't really want to do that. No. <clears throat> we'll heat up the wax. Do be careful on this. You may want to, uh, you know, may want to protect your lap. With, uh, with your old U.S. Army shirt. Uh, protect yourself from the hot wax because it, it, uh, it does just continue to burn until it cools down. It's kind of cool that way. Uh, so we melt the wax, work it on a bit. As you, if you're starting with a fresh bar of wax, you'll, you'll start to get a nice uh, uh, little channel in there. And as you get a little further in, then it, it covers a lot more of the neck. Okay. okay. And now I'll take my whole hand here and try to just get a good amount of friction on it. Just keep it going with a lot of pressure in there. Uh, sometimes it's going to be pretty hot and you want it to be hot so that it's actually melting that wax. Okay, now you should be able to notice the sheen of the wax and the color change that that makes on the cork between dry cork and waxed cork. Before you did your first waxing, you'll want to check to see if you can start to get that mouthpiece on. If you have to struggle with it too much, definitely do a bit more sanding because it's going to grab enough and as you get a little further in, it's going to want to pull the cork off. Uh, if you had time to wait a day after you put the cork on, the cement will be even, even harder still, and you can get away with a little bit more of this kind of motion. But right now, you, just, you should never have to force it, and that's ideally what you're doing anyway. 
So this fits pretty good. I can get that on pretty good. Uh, now, once we put the regular cork cement, I mean, cork grease on there, this is going to slide on really nice. Uh, again, I'm just using using the chapstick on there. And, and just to be real honest with you, this particular one, this isn't the name brand stuff. It's a little bit thin in consistency for, for, my, for my taste for this type of thing. So probably your best choice is just to use a regular known brand of cork grease that like would have come with your instrument. So we'll put a little bit of that on there, uh, get a good coat on there, and then we get our, our mouthpiece on it. When you first put the, uh, the mouthpiece on, and of course this one I've got a lot of wax and stuff on, I would have cleaned that off before. Go ahead and go all the way across the cork. Because what happens is in time, the player tends to play in a particular position and the cork compresses to that spot and then it's big and fat somewhere else. We kind of want this to, to be able to be uniform from the start. After that, then the player can do whatever they want. But when I give this back, I want to know that no matter where they want to put their mouthpiece, they can get that mouthpiece all the way on. Another thing that you can do is at this point, if you weren't happy with, uh, with the trim that you got on the end of the cork, at this point, by going all the way in, you can use the mouthpiece itself as a cutting guide and go all the way around, make it nice and pretty. Um, in the meantime, okay. So that is pretty much it. We're going to clean up our, uh, clean up a little bit of our glue here. And this is going to be done. Don't forget to get the, the inside. Uh, another thing when you've got the cork off is a good time to do a really nice cleaning on the neck. Uh, All right. Now, this cork, the old one, was actually done real well. This is, it's just got a lot of years on it. But again, we see how nice and, and clean and professional and uniform this looks. Uh, your player is going to be delighted if you give them their neck back and their cork looks like that. It, it functions real well. Uh, again, have them, you know, initially they'll want to use cork grease a little bit more frequent. But once it's got a good base on it, it should, should last, and they're not going to need to be worrying about this every time they play. But that, that ability to have a mouthpiece that you can just put on and it just slides on, it's a joy. When you're as a player, it's just a great thing. Uh, so this has been uh, Corks. I hope you've enjoyed yourself. It's one of my passions, as maybe you can tell. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about musical instrument repair, go online, do a search under band instrument repair, band instrument repair kits, and don't forget to check out our extensive educational resources at armyfieldband.com.